Word. Today we're reading from John chapter 15, verses 18 to 27. If you are using the church Bibles, it's page 902. That's John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse, 20, uh, verse 18 to 27. The hatred of the world. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> fantastic, really good. It is great to be here. There is Sunday morning. How fantastic uh, to be here with you guys. And um, why don't we start, why don't we pray before we look at this? That's a really challenging passage there. And why don't we pray first? Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we're hearing your voice and we're hearing you speak words that we don't often hear you say. And we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds this morning to hear your voice. We pray that you would grow our love for you, that you would increase our love for your church. We pray that your Holy Spirit would overwhelm us this morning with your love, with your grace, and with your truth. And we ask this, Lord Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. 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 So, uh, we are kicking off a new sermon series just for the 11, Jesus versus the world. And we're looking at some of the ways that our Christian faith marks us out as distinctive in this city. Some of the ways that we stand out as followers of Jesus. So, over the next few weeks, we will be looking at sin. We'll be looking at forgiveness. We'll be looking at freedom. We'll be looking at authority. And we'll be looking at faithfulness. And this is the groundwork. These are some core principles which will prepare us so that early next Next year, we can start to consider from a biblical perspective other cultural issues, which I'm sure lots of you are hungry to hear about, issues such as gender and sexual relationships and work and career and identity and mental health and the body. But before we launch ourselves into those topics completely, we need to do some groundwork or we will miss the mark. Because the church doesn't just stand out from our culture on a few passing superficial cultural issues of our time. You know, it's not like a political party where we have different policies and some of them are okay and some of them aren't. The foundations, the foundations on which we stand are increasingly different to the foundations of the culture around us. So that's what we're starting with today, with Jesus telling his followers just how much they stand out, just how much of a gap there is between them and the world. Eight times in this passage, eight times Jesus uses the word hate. Hate. The world hates you. 
Maybe not a word we expect to hear from Jesus, but there it is, eight times. Jesus wants us to know that there is a tension between his followers and the world, that everything isn't all easy and straightforward. He goes so far as to say the world hates you, which may come as a shock to some of you. You know, some of us probably don't feel super positive about that. Is Jesus really saying that the whole world hates the church? Surely there are some people out there in the world who feel quite positive towards the church. No? Maybe. Well, Jesus says really clearly to his followers that the world hates you. So what does this mean? What should followers of Jesus expect from our relationship with the world? Let's start with what is the world? What is the world? Before we go any further, we need to clear up some confusion about the word world. The word in Greek in the New Testament is cosmos. You might want to say it with me, cosmos. Fantastic. It's where we get our word cosmos from. (laughs) The problem is that the word world is used in four different ways in the Bible with four different but related meanings. There they are on the screen, fantastic. So there are four different meanings of the word world. So first of all, cosmos can mean the universe or the whole of planet Earth. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Since the creation of the cosmos, of the world, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen. Second, the inhabited earth. Cosmos can mean the inhabited earth, humanity as a whole. John chapter 3 verse 16. God so loved the world, the cosmos, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. He loves all the people. Fantastic. Number three, Cosmos can mean the inhabited world as far as we can imagine it, i.e. the Roman Empire. Luke chapter 2 verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, all the cosmos. Uh, It's the same word. And then finally, cosmos can mean the system of practices and standards, the spiritual system of practices and standards associated with secular or with pagan society. So 1 John, chapter 2. John the Apostle, he writes, Do not love the world, the cosmos. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Do not love the world or the things in the world. It's obvious in this letter from John the Apostle that he doesn't mean the universe. Yeah, He doesn't mean the whole of creation. It's obvious that he doesn't mean the inhabited earth as if there are only bad things going on in the human population and nothing good. It's obvious that he doesn't mean the immediate world of the Roman Empire. That's not what he's talking about. He means the whole spiritual system of practices and standards which typify secular or pagan society. Dallas Willard, a famous pastor and theologian, defines the word world like this. Our cultural and social practices that are under the control of Satan and thus opposed to God. That's how he defines world. John Mark Comer, another pastor and theologian, says the world is a system of ideas, values, morals, practices and social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institutionalized in a culture corrupted by the twin sins of rebellion against God and the redefinition of good and evil. I'll say that one again. The world in scripture means a system of ideas, values, morals, practices and social norms that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institutionalized in a culture corrupted by the twin sins of rebellion against God and the redefinition of good and evil. The world is what happens when sin becomes normal. 
The world is what happens when sin goes viral, when a culture forgets about God or chooses a different God, when good gets called evil and evil gets called good, and this all just becomes normal. The way things are, the result is the world. The world is the place, it's the spiritual realm where sin is normal. The world is the spiritual realm where sin is normal. This is so important for us to grasp as followers of Jesus. I think we expect, we expect, don't we, to be able to easily and readily for ourselves identify those things in our life that are harming or destroying our life with God. We expect to be able to look at our lives and just to be able to tell the difference between the things that are building us up and the things that are destroying our faith. But even a brief glance at human history and a brief glance over social psychology will tell you that this is unlikely. In fact, it's not true. You know, sometimes things which are out and out evil, which would stand out to everyone here as evil, have been considered normal in other cultural contexts. So chattel slavery is an obvious example, prevalent in many cultures up to the 19th century. It was considered normal. You know, people didn't walk around thinking, oh my goodness, we're doing this awful thing. It was just normal. The genocidal ambitions of the Nazi regime in Germany in the 20th century were considered in that country normal. The practice of the burning of women on their husbands' funeral pyres in India was considered normal. The first century practice of leaving unwanted babies on rubbish tips to die. All of these things in their day were considered normal by the world. The world. And in our own time, you know, broadly negative behaviours spread through the world in a way which some people have compared to a virus, to a contagious disease. So I'm going to pick some non-triggering, <laughs> some non-triggering things so that uh, uh, we can all stay on the same page for today and we can look at the more difficult things later on. But behaviours like smoking or vaping, you know, we all know how negative that is on people's health, but it spreads through social contact. Excessive alcohol use spreads through social contact. Politeness or rudeness, expressing anger, yawning. Yawning, you know, what do you do when someone yawns in your... You yawn too. All of these things spread through social contact. If you're surrounded by them, you are more likely to do them because they're just what everyone is doing. We join in with what other people are doing. These behaviours just look normal. The herd mentality is literally literally woven into the chemistry of our brains. It takes a very real effort to do something countercultural when everyone else is saying that what they're doing is normal. As the Apostle Paul says, and he's quoting wisdom which is probably at least several hundred years old, even when he's writing it down. He says in a letter to the church, he says, "...bad company ruins good morals." Bad company ruins good morals. If you're surrounded by people behaving badly and that's the norm, you are much more likely to join in. You don't have to be a follower of Jesus to believe this. You know, it's just how things are. We become like the people that we spend time with. We blend in with the culture to which we belong. Even as church, we blend in. We are being formed by the culture that we belong to. We end up adopting the practices and the habits of the world. The world. Yuval Noah Harari, a popular writer and atheist, he talks about the world, the culture that we live in, and and he means all of this positively, by the way. He's a big supporter uh, of secular humanism. He says, In earlier times, it was God who could define goodness, righteousness, and beauty. Today, those answers lie within us. Our feelings give meaning to our private lives, but also to our social and political processes. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The customer is always right. The voter knows best. If it feels good, do it. Think for yourself. These are some of the main humanist and secular beliefs. To some of you, those things may well sound appealing. 
You know, to some of you, they may just sound like common sense and obvious truth, but these principles are very specific to Western 21st century culture. They are the guidelines of the world, the world that we live in. And these principles generate the habits and practices which lead to what our culture looks like. You know, these things lead to our art, to democracy, to choice, to respect for the individual person. All fantastic. But they also lead to loneliness and greed and the commoditization of sexual intimacy, to depression, to eating disorders, to mental health issues. The world hates you, says Jesus. Let's come back to the Apostle John's letter to the church. He says, do not love the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. Now, John obviously doesn't mean don't love the people of the world. The people of the world are not our enemy. Jesus loved the people of the world enough to die for them. But notice that the three things there that John says are characteristic of the world. First of all, the desires of the flesh. Sexual love deformed into the consumption of sexual pleasure. Secondly, the desires of the eyes. You know, you need to have the nice things that you see. Market capitalism runs on this. You know, you see things, you want them, you've got to have them, you've got to buy them. The desires of the eyes. And thirdly, the pride of life. Status and achievement as the measure of our lives, your career, your achievements. Every social media platform runs on this. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of, the, uh, pride of life. Much of what we call our culture, much of what we call the Western way of life, much of what we see as life, public life at least in London, Jesus and his followers called this the world. And Jesus reminds his followers... If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, therefore, the world hates you. The world, and remember this isn't about people. As Paul will say later on, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual powers and principalities. The world is not on your side. According to Jesus, the world is the enemy of your soul. The world is the enemy of your soul. So what does that mean for us as church? What about the church and the world? The church and the world. Dr. Larry Hurtado, he's a historian of the early church, and he explores how a small group of Jesus followers became the most prevalent worldview in the Roman Empire. And they did that really quickly in like two or three hundred years. And he explains that what made the early church so compelling, what made them so attractive, wasn't that they were relevant, it wasn't that they were relatable, it wasn't that they had a really smooth marketing machine, but rather the exact opposite. The church was so different and so distinct and doing something so completely in a different way to the rest of culture that somehow it resonated with the spiritual hunger of millions of people in just a few generations from the apostles. The church was marked by five distinctive features which made it stand out against the culture of the Roman Empire. Five distinctives which made the church stand out, stand out against the backdrop of the world at the time. So the early church was multiracial and multi-ethnic, showing extraordinary unity across ethnic and cultural lines. And the church, even today across the world, shows extraordinary breadth of ethnic and cultural diversity not found in any other institution or religion. The early church was spread across socio-economic groups, with the richer members expected to contribute to caring for those with less. The early church was actively resistant to the practices of infanticide and abortion, the first of which was particularly common in the Roman Empire. 
The early church was a sexual counterculture regarding sex as a way of self-giving in permanent monogamous marriage. And in fact, abstaining from sexual activity completely was celebrated as a free choice to focus on relationships with Jesus and relationships with church family. And the early church was non-violent with a massive emphasis on forgiveness, on not, on not taking revenge. And this applied to people's personal life and in public life as well. So there's the list. That's how the early church stood out in the world. That's how the early church was different from the world. And some of you, some of you, you know, you're here today and you're looking at that list and maybe if you're a little more, a little bit more left-leaning, shall we say. (laughs) Uh, We love you, by the way. We love you. You were with me up until number three or four, yeah? And some of you may be a little bit more conservative and we love you too. You only got on board at number three and four. You know, sadly, many of us have no strong feelings at all about number five. But these five distinctive features, these five distinctive features are the basics of historic Christian orthodoxy throughout the life of the church, across history and across the world today. These are the basics of Christian orthodoxy. None of these five None of these five distinctives is a fringe issue. None of these five distinctives is an optional consideration for a disciple of Jesus. If your politics is more left-leaning, you will be keen to embrace one and two and ignore the rest. If you are more conservative or more right-leaning, you will prioritise four and maybe three. But this is not the way of Jesus. This is politics. You know, in politics, you pick the policies you like and you reject the ones you don't. But this is the way of Jesus. It comes as a whole. And there is no political or ideological body outside of the church which holds these five distinctives together. This is how we, the church of Jesus Christ, look different from the world. This is what the world sees when it looks at the church. Jesus' vision of a flourishing life is often totally the opposite of the cultural and moral and political norms of our day. So how do we resist the world? How do we stand out in this way? John Mark Comer says it clearly. He says, every follower of Jesus, I think there's a slide for this, by the way. Every follower of Jesus in every culture, has to constantly ask the question, in what ways have I been assimilated into the host culture? Where have I drifted from my identity and inheritance? And he goes on, the temptation for us in the West is less to atheism and more to a DIY faith that's a mix of the way of Jesus, consumerism, secular sexual ethics, and radical individualism. And the church needs to become a community of resistance. If we are going to stand out from the world, if we're going to become a counterculture to the world, we need to become a community of resistance. Not standing out against the world as in the people, but standing out against the world as in the spiritual systems which have been normalised by a culture which has nothing to do with the good news about Jesus and wants nothing to do with the good news about Jesus. This is the church that Jesus calls into existence. This is the church family that we are called to become more and more, standing out, distinctive, clear, and, and, and not blending in with the world and the culture around us. Jesus, even as he speaks to his first followers, says... This is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's the basics of following Jesus. And Jesus starts off by saying, you are the light of the world. Exactly. The light of the world, implying that the world is a dark place and the church needs to be light in that place. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We're going to stand out. We're going to look different. We're going to look not like the world. We need to be light because the world is dark. This is the church 
This is the church, this is the only church we read about in the New Testament. You know, this is the church of Acts 2, standing out like a beacon to people hungry for something better. The church we read in Acts 2 devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is the church of Romans 13, so obsessively in love with Jesus that Paul says, don't be bothered, don't even glance at the things that pass for pleasure in Roman culture. Just reach out for Jesus if you want happiness. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to satisfy its desires. This is the church of Revelation 3, where Jesus promises to share everything he has with the one who conquers, because there's a battle going on between the world and the church, and Jesus has already defeated the world, and he wants his church to join in with his victory. John 16, Jesus says, In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And John 15, If the world hates you, It hated me first. Jesus never imagines a church that will not stand out from the world so much that it will be a light, that it will be a beacon, that it will be a witness to how good God is. A church that will stand out so much that, yes, it will sometimes be hated. And I'll be be completely honest with you. I have struggled with this. I'm not someone who likes to be hated. Who here likes to be hated? No, exactly. You know, I've spent a lot of my Christian life wondering if there is some way of following Jesus with with everything that I have, some way of doing this, of following Jesus, following the way of Jesus that doesn't get the hate, that doesn't get the negatives. But Jesus says, you are blessed when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. On my account is important there. You're blessed when people see you following me so well that they don't like it. You are blessed, all of you, when you stand out like the church is supposed to. I've struggled with this. You know, it's taken a lot of time with Jesus A lot of time inviting the Holy Spirit to get to work on my life and on my personality and on my character, on who I am. But I I have accepted, and I invite you to accept too. I've accepted I, I won't ever be cool. Not that I ever was, but there's no chance now. I have accepted that I won't fit in. I have accepted that I won't be loved by the world. And that's okay. That's okay. The church. The church, the Greek word, the New Testament word is ecclesia. Ecclesia. It means called out. Called out. Those who are called out. The church is not a community of comfort and entertainment and affirmation. It's a community of calling and purpose. Let me encourage you, press into church life. Join a life group if you're not in one yet. Prioritize Sunday with church family. We are called out to be a community of resistance to the spiritual realm which scripture calls the world. A community of deep relational connections in a culture of individualism, transience, isolation and superficiality. We are called to be a community committed to the way of Jesus above everything else in a world without purpose and without a clear aim. We're called to be a community of stability and order in a world of change and uncertainty. This is church, standing out from the world. This is home. This is where the Holy Spirit comes to live. This is where Jesus is Lord and King. This is where the battle takes place between the world and the life-giving Spirit of God. But Jesus says, if the world hated you, it hated me first. In the world you will have trouble, but don't worry, don't stress. I have overcome the world. Let's join in with Jesus' victory 
this morning. Would you like to stand with me as you're able?